I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. I've now had five episodes dedicated to a specific Olympian god or goddess. I've tried to order them in such a way that each episode doesn't mention too much a god or goddess that I haven't already talked about. For example, last episode I talked about Hermes. One of the surviving myths of Hermes has an important role for the goddess Apollo, so it made sense for me to have the Apollo episode before the Hermes episode. But over the course of the last five episodes, one god has made a couple different guest appearances. That god is Hephaestus, and he will be the focus of this episode. Hephaestus was a god of craftsmen, responsible for blacksmiths, metalworking, carpenters, sculptors, and artists. In Greek myth, Hephaestus is often more of a supporting character. He stays in his workshop and creates things, typically weapons, that are used by other people. But make no mistake, Hephaestus was very important to the ancient Greeks. They considered him one of the gods that had taught humans what they needed to know to survive and pursue meaningful lives. Listen to the Homeric hymn to Hephaestus to get a good idea of what I mean. It goes like this. Sing, clear-voiced muses, of Hephaestus famed for inventions. With bright-eyed Athena he taught men glorious gifts throughout the world, men who before used to dwell in caves in the mountains like wild beasts. But now, that they have learned crafts through Hephaestus, the famed worker, easily they live a peaceful life in their own houses the whole year round. Be gracious, Hephaestus, and grant me success and prosperity. So with that, let's start with the myths of Hephaestus. In Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Hephaestus is one of the children of Zeus and Hera, but Hesiod says that he was actually more of an adopted son of Zeus, and that Hera gave birth to Hephaestus by herself. As I went over in the Hera episode, Hera was fed up with Zeus's affairs and was specifically angry about Zeus giving birth to Athena through his head, without her being involved. In response, Hera left Zeus for a time and creates her own son by herself. This is Hephaestus. Homer, Hesiod, and the Homeric hymns all agree that this action did not end up satisfying Hera. The problem was that Hephaestus was born handicapped, with crippled, deformed legs, and Hera felt shamed by this, especially when she compared Hephaestus to Zeus's daughter Athena, who was powerful, strong, and held to a high stature among the other Olympians. So what does Hera do? She decides to hide the deformed baby. She throws Hephaestus out of Olympus. Literally. She takes the baby and she throws him right off the top of the mountain. He falls to earth and lands in the sea. Now, if you've read a lot of myths and legends, or even watched a lot of movies, you might be aware that if a baby is abandoned to die somewhere, or if a character does not die physically on a screen, usually they don't actually die, and Hephaestus here is no different. He lands in the sea and is caught by some water nymphs, Thetis, Eurynome, and sometimes some others. They take care of Hephaestus and raise him. It's at this time that Hephaestus begins his journey to being a master craftsman and blacksmith. Homer says that for nine years, he hid in a cave and spent his time making beautiful pins, clasps, cups, and necklaces. One of the things Hephaestus made while off Olympus was a beautiful chair, and this chair plays an important role in how Hephaestus managed to get back to living on Olympus. The fullest version is found in the works of later writers in the Roman period, specifically a Greek named Pausanias, and a Roman we call Zeudohygius. But it is clear that the myth is actually really old, and was known during the archaic period of Homer and Hesiod. It is even alluded to very briefly by the Greek philosopher Plato around 375 BC in his book, The Republic. And there is also an Athenian vase from the 500s BC that shows the scene I am about to describe. As it goes, Hephaestus sent the chair to Olympus as a gift for Hera, but when she sat down in it, she realized it was booby-trapped. Invisible restraints kept her bound to the chair, stopping her from moving. None of the gods were able to release her, so they decided to bring Hephaestus back to Olympus. First, the war god Ares was sent, but he was unsuccessful in convincing Hephaestus to return and help their mother. Afterwards, a god named Dionysus, who I haven't talked about yet but you should know he was the god of wine, tried to visit Hephaestus. Naturally, the wine god got Hephaestus drunk, and in that condition, he was convinced to rejoin the Olympians on Mount Olympus and set his mother Hera free. Now, even though the myths of Hephaestus' birth, fall from Olympus, and his return are old stories and remain pretty much consistent to the Roman period, there are some different traditions as well. Just a moment ago, I said how Hera gave birth to Hephaestus in response to Zeus giving birth to Athena through his head. That means that, chronologically, Athena should be the older one. However, some versions of the myth of Athena's birth say that Hephaestus was the one that hit Zeus in the head with an axe to release Athena. Other versions say it was Prometheus, which is consistent with Hephaestus being born after Athena. 
Apollodorus' library even refers to both versions, saying that some people say Hephaestus split open Zeus's head, and others say Prometheus. So this was a pretty open question, and was known to be so in ancient Greece. Hephaestus also seems to have been cast out of Olympus another time, this time by Zeus. Interestingly, Homer gives both this myth and the hair of throwing Hephaestus version in the Iliad. Apollodorus' library also mentions this one too. In this myth, Hera is once again causing problems for the children from Zeus's affairs. This time, the recipient is a mortal man, Zeus's son Heracles, one of Zeus's most famous children, and he'll be the star of a future episode. But for today, know that Hera sent a powerful storm to try and sink the ship Heracles was sailing on, but was unsuccessful. Nevertheless, Zeus was absolutely furious. So he punishes Hera by hanging her off Mount Olympus in chains, and ties an anvil to each of her feet, pulling her down. Hephaestus now tried to save Hera, but Zeus ended up throwing him off Mount Olympus in his anger. Hephaestus fell for a full day, eventually landing on the island of Lemnos, where he was nursed back to health by the nymph Thetis, one of the nymphs in the other version, too. In this Zeus-throwing version, Hephaestus' legs become injured after falling from Earth, unlike the other version where his deformities are the reason he fell. These two versions are likely different replications of the same basic ideas about Hephaestus, and that they were included as two different myths that occurred one after the other. Besides his relationship with his parents, I've already shared the myth of his attempted rape of Athena in other episodes, but Hephaestus also had a not-great marriage with the goddess of love Aphrodite. This myth seems to have been very popular among the ancient Greeks. Homer, Pausanias, Ovid, Plato, and some others all provide information on it. I think the longest telling is by Homer in the Odyssey. One of the ways Zeus persuaded Hephaestus to let his mother Hera free from the chair was to promise him Aphrodite as a wife. Now, why was Zeus able to do this? In this myth version, Aphrodite is a daughter of Zeus, and was not born from Oranos' severed genitals like I talked about in the creation episodes. Since she is his daughter, Zeus can give her away in marriage, just like how this was historically the case in many places around the world, including ancient Greece. So Hephaestus and Aphrodite were married, but Aphrodite wasn't too hot on the whole get married to Hephaestus thing, and she soon began an affair with her real lover, Ares. But Helios the sun god saw them in the act and told Hephaestus, who bitterly went to his forge to plan revenge. He worked at his anvil and made chains that could not be broken, and then went back home and draped them all over the bed and hung them from the roof. Finally, he pretended to go to Lemnos, his favorite place on earth. When Ares saw Hephaestus leave, he hurried to Hephaestus' house to see Aphrodite. But when they went to the bed and lied down, the chains of Hephaestus fell down and wrapped around them. Very quickly, the two lovers were trapped, unable to move, unable to escape. Hephaestus quickly returns after Helios told him his trap worked and angrily calls all the gods together. Come, all you blessed immortals, see what has happened here. No matter for laughter nor yet forbearance, Aphrodite had Zeus for a father, because I am lame, she never ceased to do me outrage and give her love to destructive Ares, since he is handsome and sound-footed, and I am a cripple from my birth. Yet for that my two parents are to blame, no one else at all, and I wish that they had never begotten me. You will see the pair of lovers now as they lie embracing in my bed. The sight of them makes me sick at heart. Yet I doubt their desire to rest there longer, fond as they are. They will soon unwish their posture there, but my cunning chain shall hold them both fast till her father Zeus has given me back all the betrothal gifts I bestowed on him for his wanton daughter. And so the gods came, Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, Hermes, and others. But all of the goddesses stayed away, keeping inside their own homes. The gods stood at the entrance of Hephaestus' bedroom and laughed. However, one god, Poseidon, did not. Instead, he asked Hephaestus to let Ares go, saying, let him go, and I will promise that he shall pay in full such rightful penalty you ask for, and pay in the presence of all the gods. But Hephaestus said, Pledges for trustless folk are trustless pledges. If Ares should go his way, free of his chains and his debt alike, what then? Could I fetter yourself in the presence of all the gods? To which Poseidon replied that if Ares did deny the debt, Poseidon would allow Hephaestus to bind him. So with that, entirely thanks to the mediation of Poseidon, Hephaestus let Ares and Aphrodite go, and Ares fled to Thrace in northern Greece, and Aphrodite fled to Cyprus. I should note that that is the version in Homer's Odyssey. In the later retelling by Ovid in Roman times, Hephaestus does not catch Ares and Aphrodite with unbreakable chains. 
Instead, he uses a net that was made so fine that it was invisible. Regardless of how he caught the lovers, Hephaestus' marriage with Aphrodite came to an end. Presumably, Hephaestus then did what broken-hearted men have done since the dawn of time. That is, the ancient Greek equivalent of getting a fresh haircut, drinking some protein smoothies, getting ripped, and going to events to meet new people. Because at some point, Hephaestus got a new wife. In both 8th century BC Hesiod's Theogony and Homer's Iliad, Hephaestus' wife is said to be Aglaia, one of the young Graces, a daughter of Zeus and the Oshinid Eurynome. Now, so far, you've heard of two items that Hephaestus created in his forge, a chair and chains or a net, and both were used to capture gods. But Hephaestus' creations were much more diverse. Some of Hephaestus' creations were gifts for the other gods. Hephaestus was responsible for building the homes of all the gods on Olympus. He also built the chariots used by the sun god Helios, and a chariot for Ares, and the arrows used by Apollo and Artemis. For mortals, Hephaestus' work often ended up in the hands of heroes. He made several bowls for different kings, but also, as you'd probably expect, suits of armor and a whole lot of weapons, especially for those heroes involved in the Trojan War. In another example, Hesiod in one of his poems called The Shield of Heracles goes to great length to explain how Hephaestus made a breastplate and shield for the hero Heracles. He gives a full description of the decorations on them, saying that the shield was a shimmer with enamel and white ivory and electrum, and it glowed with shining gold. In the center was Phobos, fear, who stared backwards with eyes that glowed with fire. His mouth was full of teeth in a white row, fearful and daunting. And that was just the center of the shield. Around that was a whole series of artworks, images of the death goddess Care dragging a wounded man and a dead man by the feet, twelve heads of snakes, boars, and lions glaring at each other, pictures of spearmen, and images of gods. And all of this on a shield. It must have been quite something. The description makes a face to seem quite like the artist, and not just a metal worker. I have no idea how all of that could possibly fit on a single shield, but I think the point is that it's obviously made by a god, so normal rules don't apply. So where did Hephaestus build all these things? When Hephaestus was raised by Thetis and Eurynome, he had a workshop within the cave he was hiding. This was his first workshop, and the cave was located on the shore of Oceanus, the old titan and the saltwater river the Greeks believed surrounded the world. After that, though, Hephaestus built a new forge within the bronze palace he made for himself on Mount Olympus. In other sources, it seems Hephaestus had other forges as well, one on his favorite island of Lemnos, and more on other volcanic islands such as Lepera and Etna. In his forges, Hephaestus does not work alone. In his forge on the island of Lemnos, Hephaestus was helped by two twin sons, called the Cabiroi. They were apparently dwarfs, and were worshipped as part of the cult of Hephaestus on Lemnos, and were also important in the cults of a few Greek goddesses. These cults involved drunken orgies, dancing, and that kind of thing. Hellenistic Greek and Roman sources also say that the Cyclopses, the crafters of Zeus's lightning, also joined Hephaestus in his forge and workshops. But on Olympus, Hephaestus has the help of the Kure Kurase, the Golden Maidens. These were actually another one of Hephaestus' creations. Exactly as their name suggests, these are beings that are made of gold and look like young women. They are strong and can speak and have intelligence. So we have women made of metal that can speak, think, and do things. Sounds to me that Hephaestus made himself some robots to help him. In addition, Homer mentions Hephaestus made golden tripods for the gods' palaces, and that they would move around by themselves on wheels and bring food to the gods' banquets. And he even made for King Alcinous of Colchis a series of golden watchdogs to guard his own palace. A later source says that gold singers made by Hephaestus inhabited the temple of Apollo at Delphi. And then, in addition to all those, there is Talos. Talos was another creation of Hephaestus, a large giant. He was made of bronze this time, not gold, and he was used as a giant bodyguard. When Zeus kidnapped one of his lovers, Europa, he brought her to Crete and then put Talos on guard there. Talos didn't have blood like a normal human either. Instead, he had one vein that went from his ankle to his head and was sealed at the end with a nail. Talos was eventually killed when the nail was pulled out and all his blood gurgled onto the ground. These all sound like Hephaestus invented artificial intelligence. But before everyone gets excited about robots and gets all ancient aliens, let's talk about something. In ancient Greece, statues were generally thought to be alive in some way. Things like trees were believed to house spirits, nymphs, 
But for example, take a statue of a god. Since they looked like a god, they were thought to actually be linked to a god in some way. A good imitation is part of the real thing. This is actually an idea that is found beyond ancient Greece, and anthropologists have identified this concept in folk beliefs and tribal religions all over the world. This is the same fuzzy logic that is used to justify voodoo dolls. There are actually other stories that tell about human-like robots too in other cultures. Take the 1001 Arabian Nights. This collection of stories from the Middle East was compiled between 700 and 1300 AD, with roots probably going back much further. In one story, called the City of Brass, travelers find a lost city in the desert and they encounter marionette puppets that dance by themselves, without the use of strings. In another Arabian Nights story, the story of the three calendars, there is a mechanical man that drives a boat. Interestingly, there is also some anecdotal evidence that mechanical engineering may have been more advanced in the ancient world than most people think. In Hellenistic Greece, from 323 BC to 31 BC, there were inventors that supposedly came up with early fire trucks able to pump water, the world's first cuckoo clock, again powered by water, and a steam turbine as well. We don't have any physical archaeological evidence of these devices today, just descriptions of them and maybe some drawings. But there is an artifact which may have been an early form of calculator. Besides that, though, there's no reason to think that these devices were in widespread use either. It seems like these devices were limited to prototypes found within an inventor's workshop, possibly sold for a lot of money due to their novelty. Just like with Hephaestus' own, they could be the fabulous creations of a lonesome craftsman gifted out to honor VIPs. In ancient Greece, there were a few festivals held in Hephaestus' honor, such as the Chalcia and Hephaestia in the area of Athens. These festivals probably featured races, where people raced in groups and passed lit torches to the next person on their team running the next leg of the race, just like a relay. Another festival was called the Etneia, and was celebrated at Mount Etna in Italy, where Hephaestus was also believed to keep a workshop within the volcano. Hephaestus did not have a lot of temples in the Greek city-states, but he did have two major cult centers, one in Athens and one on the island of Lemnos. In general, Hephaestus was linked with volcanoes, and because of that, Lemnos was supposed to be the location of another Hephaestus' workshops, because of the volcanoes there. On Lemnos, Hephaestus' worship was closely associated with the cult of the Cabiroi, his twin sons. Not much is known about this Cabiroi cult today. It was considered one of ancient Greece's mystery religions. People took part in rituals, myth reenactments, and other things, but did not give details on what those were or talked about them to the uninitiated. The few things we do know do not fit easily into the main traditions of Greek mythology. Because of that, it's theorized the cult of the Kibiroi and maybe the god Hephaestus himself were maybe originally from a pre-Greek population inhabiting some of the Greek islands, and that later, the Kabiroi were incorporated into Greek mythology as the sons of Hephaestus. This is just another example of how earlier stories were being absorbed and bubbling up in the myths over time. That brings us to the end of the episode for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please get the word out and tell your friends. And while you're at it, please head over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and give the pod a five-star review. And finally, remember to subscribe to the pod on your favorite streaming platform. Thank you for listening.